All my life, I was easily one of the happiest kids. I never had any bouts of depression, never suffered from overwhelming anxiety, and I was never emo. It wasn't until 2019 that I'd ever experienced anything so dreadful, and I'd like to share my story with you today. Now this story is going to be a bit out there. I haven't been what I'd describe as average in a long time, so let's go back to where it all started. September 29th, 2018, and honestly the only date that I've ever felt was important enough to remember. This was the day that I took mushrooms for the first time. Now don't get me wrong, I know how this sounds already, but the experience I had changed my life. I'd been shown that life was more beautiful and exciting than I'd initially understood it, and I'd taken so many aspects of being alive for granted. I learned in one night how to truly love myself for the things that were important, my heart and my mind, and how imperative it was for me to expand these things within me. Once that happened to me, I got a little too excited about the prospects. I believed that everyone should try them at least once. Everyone should be able to feel this in touch with themselves, and if everyone in the world did take them, it would shift the consciousness of the human race. The potential of this, what felt to me like universal understanding instigating peace between us because it became obvious to me the second I took them, made me anxious to share. And that is where this story begins. See, I developed this idea of starting a YouTube channel. I wanted to share information about psychedelic compounds as objectively as it could. All sides. I was tired of hearing the same old drug scare tactics that science had since disproved. I wanted people to know the true benefits and dangers of these compounds. I didn't need everyone to feel like they had to try them. All I wanted was objective information so people could make their own choices. And I spent weeks looking up countries where laws regarding psychedelics were more lenient. After some time, I found out that Vietnam had no laws around these compounds, which excited me as I'd been there before with some friends. I really missed that place and I was excited to go back. This is where I made my first mistake. See, I've been trying to convince a friend of mine to come with me on the trip but he'd been working on removing himself from debt, which kept him from the opportunity. However, another guy that I knew had been there when I was asking my friend to go, and he jumped at the opportunity. He said, give me a few days to decide if I can go. The next day, he was fired from his job, and he agreed to be my camera crew, as long as his girlfriend was able to go as well. That was his only condition. Fast forward a bit, and we get to Vietnam. Now, I'd actually had a girl in Vietnam waiting for me when I got there. I met her the first time, and we'd only met three times before I had to leave back to America, but we stayed in touch and I really felt like I loved her. More stories about her another time. So it's about two weeks in Vietnam and I'm working as much as I can on getting this channel going. I'm walking through the streets asking people if they would be willing to share their psychedelic experiences on camera, if they'd take the substances, and I got mostly positive feedback. Didn't take too long though as I was inquiring that I found out that even though there were no written laws about psychedelics, the cops don't like them anyway. And if I was caught with them, caught documenting them, one of two things could happen. I'm either shipped back to my country never to return to Vietnam again, or my head is cut off. Now this was the first striking blow. Everything I came to do in Vietnam felt hopelessly lost in an instant. This really freaked me out, mostly because I'm a cheapskate, a penny pincher. I've always been a saver, but sometimes I'm too tight with my money. And traveling to Vietnam really took a chunk out of me. Hotels, food, renting an apartment for all of us to stay, it all came out of my pocket. See, I didn't know this, but the friends who came with me really didn't have a lot of money with them. They pretty much expected me to take care of everything until we got the channel rolling, which was not the original plan. I tried convincing my new roommate and friend that he needed to get a job, which he fought me to tedium on. He'd say, I came here to be a cameraman. I'm not interested in getting a job out here. Eventually, I was able to convince him to get a job, but honestly, I don't think he ever really tried. Don't get me wrong, he'd sign up and interview for teaching jobs, but I don't think he ever really put the effort into actually getting the job. Not that I know that, it's just the way it seemed, which weighed a lot on me. See, here I was paying for everything, but I was also sharing a room with them. I had a master bedroom, and he and his girlfriend had a smaller room down the hall. Now, their room was just a room. Mine, however, had a balcony, which they would use to go and smoke on. My room had a fridge and a kitchen, which they would use to cook in. Between these two things alone, I never had any privacy. I was always in a constant state of wondering when someone would knock on my door next. On top of that, my friends started to borrow money from their parents, but because they didn't have banks, they'd have their parents send me the money and I'd have to go out to an ATM for them. Before that, I was paying for everything. Now, if you can handle a little more complaining, I was also in a foreign country all alone. 
I had nobody but my girlfriend to help me through everything, and honestly, without her, I would have failed completely. I was homesick, I missed my family and friends, I had nobody to talk to. Mentally, my roommates were kids. They weren't emotionally mature enough to understand what I was going through, and my girlfriend, I mean, her first language is Vietnamese. She loved me, and she did everything she could, but we just couldn't bridge that language gap. No matter where I went, I felt alone. I was in a city with more people than I'd ever seen before, and I was more alone than I'd ever been. So let's just recap this real quick. I'm in a country I don't know, with a group of friends I barely know, my first real girlfriend who I can't connect with on a deeper level, I'm homesick, lonely, and hemorrhaging money with the worst part being that I failed instantly. The thing that I went there to do was impossible. So there's this strip in Vietnam called Boi Ven. It's the party district, the sin city of Vietnam where everything's permitted. Cocaine and marijuana are being sold on the streets, cops are surveying the perimeter so they know everyone's being safe. In the bars, they would sell laughing gas in these giant ass balloons, and I'd reached a state of mind where I was guilting myself, blaming myself for everything that had happened. If I'd never decided to bring those friends, I never would have spent so much money. If I'd done better research on Vietnam and psychedelics, I wouldn't have made such a terrible mistake. But when I hit these balloons, I was happy again. I was bliss, and I could laugh genuinely. I'm not proud of the fact that I used them like I did, and I'm even less proud that I became addicted to them. I went to those bars far too often, and every day just got worse and worse for me. One day, my new roommate asked me if I was depressed. He said he could tell something was off, and I laughed at him. I never imagined that was even possible for me. A few days later, his girlfriend gets a job as an English teacher. Finally, a lot of that money stress was gone. See, English teachers in Vietnam averaged three grand a month, which would have been more than enough for both of them. And for the next week, I was content again. I even stopped going to the bars. That's when I got some news that I did not expect. One day, my friend's girlfriend comes back home from work with a sad face. She says that she was let go. What happened? My friend and I asked, to which she replied, they found out that I was only 17. When she said that, it struck me. All of the dread came back with even more, as though it had taken a week to silently reproduce. Not only had I taken a 17-year-old girl out to Vietnam, I now realized what kind of people I was with. There was no chance of them getting a job, with her being too young and him not really even trying. I was stuck. From this point on, I was pretty much at the bars every night. I'd puff on those balloons to escape the pain, and I'd hide it from everyone. One day, I went to Boy Ven. I was walking down the road when these two Norwegian guys walked up to me. We struck up conversation while I walked to the bar, and they followed and sat down next to me. We chatted for a bit, and I ordered some balloon and lit up a joint. One of them asked how I enjoyed living in Vietnam, and I looked up at him and replied, Well, I'm depressed. They both laughed and shared some weed while I puffed on my balloon. One of the Norwegian guys asked what I was puffing on, so I shared it with him, and once he inhaled, I saw him go away. The guy completely disappeared into his own mind, and it scared the hell out of his friend. I looked at the blank Norwegian and thought, this is what I'm doing to myself. Just then, their phone rings, and the concerned friend grabs his buddy, trying to wake him up. After a few seconds, he stands him up and looks at me, just as I'm taking a puff of this balloon, and he says with fear in his eyes and his voice, this is my brother. Just then, I had what I can only call a bad trip. I imagined my brother and I walking down Boy Ven and someone gave him a balloon. I watched my brother disappear, and I hated the guy who did it to him. I even knew that the high from these balloons is short acting, and I still dumped all of that guilt onto myself. That, mixed with everything else I was feeling, threw me into what I can only describe as PTSD. I know that sounds so stupid to get PTSD from nitrous oxide, but what I was going through was already so bad. This trip broke the camel's back, and I had triggers. If I smelled cigarette, since Boy Ven always smelled like that, if I smelled latex or rubber, it would remind me of the balloon. If I altered my perception with coffee or weed, it'd be like my brain would just stop. I'd go into this fight or flight mode and I'd be terrified to a point where I was frozen. I'd start shaking uncontrollably. I'd start crying if I tried to describe what was going on. I felt like I was broken and every day from that point got worse. See, here's the weird thing about depression. Each day started out okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, I never felt normal. I'd wake up and I was able to take one full breath before it felt like I was constricted. As though someone grabbed hold of me and I was no longer to take another full breath for the rest of the day. No matter how hard I tried, no amount of air was satisfying. There'd also be what felt like random moments in the day where my vision would change. 
It felt like my peripheral vision was enhanced, but somehow at the same time I would sink into my head. This change in vision was scary to me, and I'd have what I can only describe as strictly perceptual anxiety attacks, but beyond that, the days were mostly normal. One thing I did notice is things would stick to me, little things that normally wouldn't get to me, like if someone looked at me like they were angry or if I made a mistake in the city. Normally I'd think about it for a second and it would bounce off me and I wouldn't think about it for the rest of the day, but with this traumatic depression in the mix of things, it would stick to me for the rest of the day, sinking me further and further into this self-loathing, dreadful state of mind where nothing mattered and I was the reason that everything had fallen apart. This one example comes to mind. I'd ordered food for myself and my girlfriend and while I was waiting I started working on a YouTube video. I really got into it and so much time passed without me even glancing at my phone. When I finally did check my phone, I found that the guy who was bringing my food had already arrived and had been there for quite some time. I rushed downstairs to see if he was still at the front door and there he was. I opened the door to this sad Vietnamese man who looked at me and said, Why did you not answer your phone? I've been calling. He sounded defeated and disappointed and after my sincerest apologies to the man, he gave me my food and replied, I've been waiting a long time. I just stood in the doorway and he left before I could even tip him for his trouble. I felt terrible, and no matter how many times my girlfriend told me not to worry about it, the guilt I felt never left until the next morning, where I woke up with nothing but one full breath and a pit of emptiness for the rest of the day. My Vietnamese girlfriend, Alia, finally decided that I needed a vacation. She took me to her home city, Dalat. And I had visited Dalat the first time I was in Vietnam. I loved that place. It reminded me of Oregon. But even that didn't help much. It even got so bad that I started putting everything on her, as though all the things that I'd been dealing with were somehow curable if she wasn't around anymore. And long story short, I decided to break up with her while we were in Dalat. We decided to ride out the rest of our trip, and then once we got back to the city, it was over. A day or so later, I got a text from my friends who'd come with me that they were going to return to America as there was no way for them to survive in Vietnam any longer. When I got that text, I felt so much weight fall off my shoulders. I no longer had to fear for their safety. I didn't have to worry about transferring money to them so they could continue to live with me. And the idea that I was finally going to be able to have my privacy back, as selfish as that thought was, was comforting. I would hoped that maybe that alone would solve this anxiety that I was feeling because for the rest of the day, I felt like me. The next day, however, the pain came right back. The constricted breathing, the amplified terrifying peripheral changes, the sticky little anxious moments that hit me through the day. I was still getting worse. And when I finally got back from Saigon with my girlfriend, I still went to the bars to puff on the laughing gas so I could band-aid the situation that I was in. While I was in Dalat though, my girlfriend Aelia and I decided to stay together and believe that we could work everything out now that I felt more free. Now I know I'm going to tell all these stories again with more detail, so I'm not going to go so much into Vietnam and that situation, but I will say that I lived in that traumatic dread for a total of almost three months. It wasn't until I was chatting with some of my Vietnamese friends about psychedelics that they all agreed that they wanted to try LSD with me. They'd all tried mushrooms before and it was a great experience for them, so the idea was to go to Dalat, find a beautiful B&B next to a pond, and trip there. The only problem was getting the LSD. A couple days later, I found some Americans at a bar and they gave me the information for a plug out in Vietnam who would sell 1P. See, 1P LSD is a research chemical that acts exactly like LSD, but because it was developed so recently, there are no legalities surrounding it. So I bought five tabs and waited for the trip. However, once I got the LSD, nobody wanted to try it anymore, and I was in such a state of fear that I didn't want to take it either. See, this is another weird thing that I went through in Vietnam. I could no longer trust myself. I had researched psychedelics almost all day every day since the day I tried mushrooms. I'd learned about their ability to cure addiction, depression, PTSD, and anxiety. And yet, no matter what I told myself, I was too afraid. I figured it would hurt me more. It would put my mind over the edge, and I would never be the same again. At this point, my depression felt like I could just live with it. It was terrible. I wasn't me. I lost the person that I was, but I was so afraid of losing myself more that I ignored everything that I'd learned. God, I even tried LSD many times before going to Vietnam, but my family and friends' voices echoed in my head. I called them many times to try and get some help, and any time I mentioned using a psych to remedy my ailment, they all said the same thing. Barry, a drug did this to you. You can't use another one to fix it. And to me, that was rational. Or at the very least, it was enough of an excuse for me to continue to band-aid my problem. It got so bad, though, that one day I called my mother and told her that I was coming home. 
She told me that her and my brother would be coming out to visit me in two months, and if I could make it at least that far, then I could return with them. I bought the plane ticket, and again felt a huge weight lift off my shoulders. Yet another full day of Happy Berry. I could finally leave this situation. Sure, I failed in every way. Sure, I wasted this opportunity to share objective research on psychedelics, and I even took for granted this wonderful opportunity to be in this beautiful country. Instead of living in the moment and being alive in Vietnam, I focused on my misery. It made me look at Vietnam with disdain and with an understanding that I couldn't make it. Weeks went by and I felt this way. Many times I'd break up with Alia and just get back together with her. I was an emotional wreck and I was so lost that I hadn't even realized that I'd misplaced myself. I don't remember the exact moment, but it got to a point where I knew I couldn't go on like this anymore. I didn't care if I ruined my mind, and I didn't care if the LSD made me worse. I'd tried everything. I sought out therapy. I searched for native English-speaking friends to talk to, which did help sometimes, but never for very long. I decided that I was going to trust myself, and even if it made everything worse, I at least tried. My core was so dark and empty that I would wonder if it was even worth living like this anymore. So I took the LSD, and I went out into the city. This is the day that changed everything. Now, I've told this part of the story before, but as soon as I took the LSD, everything changed. The come-up was probably the most grueling and strenuous come-up I've ever felt. I'd gotten a ride into the city, and I had trips about being so miserable and uncomfortable that jumping off the bike in heavy traffic would instantly fix my problems. When I finally got off the bike and was walking through the city, I went through all of my trauma, which is still an annoying word to use for what I was going through, but I don't have any other words to describe it as accurately. The LSD inflated my worst fears, amplifying them to a point where they were all I saw. I was so terrified and overwhelmed when, all of a sudden, I started laughing at it. The problems became so large they were ridiculous. There was no way to actually deal with any of the things that I was worrying about. It was just pointless worry for no reason. I must have looked like a madman walking through the streets of Saigon laughing at nothing, but it felt so good to be defeating all of this, and seemingly all at once. Time went on and I finally got back to my apartment where my girlfriend was waiting to trip sit me. I looked in the mirror and exclaimed, Hey, wait a minute. I know you. I haven't seen you for such a long time and I missed you so much. Seeing myself smile with genuine happiness brought a rush of euphoria that I will never forget. I started playfully yelling at myself in the mirror as my girlfriend thought I was losing my mind. Little did she know I'd finally found it again. I was saying things like, Really, Barry? Aw, you're so lonely. You have nobody to talk to, so you have to go puff on laughing gas? Come on, Barry, where's the logic in that? If you're so lonely, go make friends, you idiot. You got addicted to the balloons, and you made an excuse so you didn't have to stop. Jesus, man, followed by hysteric laughter. From that day forward, I lived. I remembered exactly why life was so beautiful and how I'd taken it for granted. How I'd selfishly held on to problems that didn't exist, like worrying about spending too much money or not working on YouTube as much, and how I'd been putting that on others. My sadness was their sadness, as I wouldn't allow myself to just enjoy the moment I was in. Everything was so blissful, and for the rest of my two months in Vietnam, that perspective remained. I remembered that I was in paradise with no responsibility, and I let Vietnam take me on any and every serendipitous adventure that it wanted to throw me into. Fast forward a little bit, and I finally get back home. And only after a couple months, I fell into another heavy bout of depression. This time, it was due to some very different reasons. See, I'd left my girlfriend in Vietnam, and we had no idea if we were ever going to see one another again. I'm also not the best at keeping contact, and this angered her so much that she just stopped talking to me. Once I had returned, I'd also realized that I spent my time in Vietnam killing my channel. I stopped posting as much, and I'd even decided to stop doing YouTube altogether. I really missed Vietnam as well. Once my mindset had returned to normal, I regretted buying that plane ticket back to America. I missed my little paradise. And though I was happy to be back in America, I still had not accomplished anything that I set out to do. I felt stuck in a different way. No more YouTube. No more goals for my life. And the stuff that I wanted to talk about on YouTube seemed to alienate my subscribers. I felt worried that I could no longer be honest with my audience. And I fell away from the thing that I loved to do. Share my stories with my community. I started picking up jobs keeping myself from going crazy, but right after that, COVID hit and everything shut down. And if there's nothing worse for a poor mindset than being stuck at home, you let me know. As I fell into depression this time, I knew that I didn't want to rely on a psychedelic to remedy me. I realized something deeper within me was wrong, and if I wanted to fix it, I had to do it. So I started changing my routines. 
I went on more bike rides and walks around town, which would help sometimes. I would take baths with lavender and Epsom salt as they both induce calming effects on the body. Those two were just band-aids though and I knew I needed to try something more. So I went to the doctor. I told him about my problem and he asked if I had ever experienced anything like this before. I told him about my situation in Vietnam and how I'd fixed it with LSD. He stopped, laughed, and said, Well, I wouldn't have prescribed that, but it works. And he tried to prescribe me pills for the issue. Now, don't get me wrong here. If you're on antidepressants, I have no ill will for you, and I don't mean to cast aspersions here. There are those out there who have legitimate chemical imbalances that require a supplement or medication to counter. I, however, know for a fact that I don't have any chemical abnormality. This wasn't neurological, it was something else. So I turned him down and asked for therapy instead. The therapy was helpful. I had one or two sessions with an open-minded doctor who actually told me that my stomach problems could induce stress. She gave me this analogy. You know how onstage actors typically throw up when they're stressed? That's because the stomach and the stress region of the brain are connected for some reason. So if you have stomach pain, you may actually confuse that with anxiety. That fact right there almost solved everything. I now realized that there was something else going on as I'd suffered from H. pylori in my life before and my stomach lining had been weakened because of that. So I got some omeprazole to help my poor tummy out, which did a lot for the situation. The last thing I did was read. My buddy Muttley recommended me a book called The Chimp Paradox, which splits the mind into three parts. The chimp, the human, and the computer. The idea is that the human, that's you. That's the person who's aware, the person who replies in conversation, the person writing this script right now. The computer, that's the muscle memory, the part of you that plays video games without even looking at the buttons, the person who replies for you when your mind is somewhere else. And then there's the chimp. This is the instinctual part of you, the emotional side, the side that overreacts, gets angry or overly emotional. And this book describes the chimp as five times stronger than the human. It's not in control, but it's like when your pit bull sees another dog on the sidewalk. It starts freaking out as you try to calm her down, but she's so much stronger than you. What the book told me to do was disconnect myself from the monkey. When I get upset, don't kick myself for being upset. Realize that it's the chimp overreacting. People often kick themselves for the emotions they have, but that's not in your control. What you can control, however, is how you react. The book then goes into how to react. When you feel anxiety or anger or any other powerful emotion, instead of freaking out or screaming or whatever it is you do, remember that it's the monkey doing this. Thank the chimp for the emotion, and allow it to have the emotion, but then talk to it like a child. Hey, seriously, thank you for letting me know that the guy who cut me off is an asshole. I wholeheartedly agree, but we aren't in danger. Nothing's broken. We don't need this emotion right now. It's okay. And as strange as that may sound, it really helped a lot. It's little tricks like these from those out there who care enough to seek out an answer and are gracious enough to share it with others that help me through my depressive bouts. My second story was certainly not as intense as the first, but since that second experience, I've never entered that despairing state of mind again. Anytime I get sad these days, I take the time to figure out what's going on, and if figuring it out isn't enough, I confront it. There was a time that I realized a friend of mine I cared about very much didn't really care that much about me. I'd hidden it from myself for a long time, and I even talked to friends about it, but it wasn't until I went to him and chatted with him about it that the pain really went away. Everyone works differently. Some of us use self-help books and motivational speakers. Others use medications. Some people distract themselves and live with the pain. And others take psychedelics. No matter what you do, you mustn't judge yourself or put yourself down for what works. People want you to believe that we're all the same and that our minds all work the same. One cure for you should work for all, but you just have to trust yourself and those closest to you. No matter what happens, just don't give up. When I was in Vietnam and I told my friends that I was depressed, the only advice they had was, well, Barry, you can't fix it. You just have to learn to live with it now. But that's just not who I am. And I've proven at least to myself that this is simply not true. If you say you can or you say you can't, you're right. And it's kind of funny the verbiage we use when we're sad. I've had friends say that life is meaningless and there's no reason to go on. I've heard people say that life's a joke. The bitter irony there is a joke isn't a joke if it has no meaning. 